So church, do I have your permission to preach the Word of God the way it's intended to preach? Do I have your full attention this morning that you, because honestly, the word that that I believe God is bringing to our church is one of those grounding foundational words that if we receive it correctly, it literally will transform how you read the Bible from now on in. So, so let's go in together. Alrighty. So we've all got our favorite verses, hey? Who's got a favorite verse? Everyone has a favorite verse, right? And we have an idea of what it kind of means, or we like to think we know what it kind of means. Mine is Matthew 6, 33. And for ages, I thought that, man, if I seek the kingdom of heaven and all his righteousness, then God's going to give me everything I want. Wow. All I have to do is be a Christian, a ka-ching, millionaire sal coming through. Still waiting, God. It's like 20 years. Maybe I haven't heard you correctly. And so soon. Oh, there's a word. And so we have these kind of verses, and we're like, does it actually mean what I think it means, or does it mean something completely different in how it was originally intended to mean? And so it's very important that you and I start to grapple with the Bible and start to see, how am I meant to read this correctly, because it deserves the, just, the, it deserves the, the, the utmost importance in how we read interpret the Bible for us today in 2023. Amen? So, the question I want to ask is, how well are we interpreting the Bible? Are we doing it correctly? How do we know what God is saying is actually for us? Or was it actually something for a different audience altogether, or both? Whoa, he said it's both. (laughs) So we're not expected to memorize the Bible, right? Do I need a different mic? I don't need a mic, I'm Italian. But the, if you come to my household, <laughs> put earmuffs on <laughs> and subtitles. Um, yeah, can they not understand what we say? It's like, mum, it's not a rap song, it's dinner. <laughs> anyway, so, love you, ma. You have to love me back, the Bible says. So, we're not expected, we're, we're not expected to, me- you're not expected to memorize all this, okay? Why don't you thank the Lord right now? Come on, thank the Lord. <laughs> you don't have to memorize it in Hebrew or in Greek or in Italian for the other correct language of the world. Um, but you are called to obey whatever is written in this book and obey it correctly and understanding it correctly is very important. Otherwise, things can go horribly wrong when you're versed with scriptures like this, Matthew 18, 8 to 9. If your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better that you enter life maimed or crippled than have two hands or two feet. Or if your eye causes you to sin, Then gouge it out now. So if the host can pass the saws and the spoons, we're going to apply this scripture in its full. I'm joking. Don't edit that because I don't want to go viral. Um, Katie Brown has already. We We don't see many people walking around with cut off hands and cut off foot, right? But yet the Bible tells you to do it. So what's going on? Do we see how important it is that we have a correct understanding and how to interpret the scripture before it does damage to our bodies, right? All right, so cool. But let me say real quick, you can take verses out of its context carefully and apply it to your life if it's in the contextualization of the whole Bible. Okay, so if God says, I love you to Moses... You see that through all the scripture that he loves people? Guess what? He loves you too, Lucas, okay? Does that make sense? Yeah, cool. But then I can get into trouble right here because, like, I have my, my favorite Bible verse imprinted on me. I've got Leviticus 19.28 tattooed somewhere on my body, I think. I think you see, I'm joking, I don't, right? You're freaking out because the Bible says do not get tattooed, right? And all of a sudden, after the service, I'll have an altar call for all those who have tattoos in their body. But when you read it in its contextual, how it's presented with the verses before and after it and what God is wanting to say, you can take the heart of it. You know what it's all about? Pagan ritual. So back then, people would actually cut themselves for the dead and they would actually mark their bodies for their pagan gods. And so I belong to you. I'm going to 
mark my body for you pagan gods. And God is saying to the, for the, to the Israelites with the 613 laws found in the Old Testament, if you'd like to keep most of them, then please grow your beard like Lucas because it also tells you not to cut your beard. Then you have to make sure that you don't read it in an NIV translation and it says do not tattoo your body. And all of a sudden we have a whole bunch of confused people going, why are you tattooed and preaching when the Bible clearly says not to. But when you read it in the right context... It's actually not what God is trying to say because you don't find that anywhere else. Actually, in 1 Kings, I think it's Elijah who's calling down fire from heaven. The people would cut their bodies for their God, pagan God. So it's all of a sudden you see a thread. Hang on. This is about pagan rituals. It's not about looking sweet on stage, right? Cool. And by the way, the word tattoo came out in the 1700s before the Bible was written. So, so how we go? After the Bible was written. This morning, I want to talk to you about how, you put the title up, how to exit, yes, Lord, I'm listening, how to exegete, can I have another one, how to exegete scripture with good hermeneutics, how to, can we get someone to unmute MC2 at the sound desk, thanks, Nate. Nathan, you have tattoos, why'd you mute me <laughs> I'm backing you here. The title of my message is, is exegeting scripture with good hermeneutics. Whoa, big words for a Sunday lunchtime. What we're going to be looking at is exegeting scripture with good hermeneutics. So when we actually, when we read the Bible, we need to know what God actually means, not what we can make his word mean. We don't want to twist it to mean something else. We want to know what it actually means. So what is context? So we've got context. It's a two-part answer. Context is understanding. What is context? It is understanding what came before during and after a statement is made, okay? Very important you know that. The second part of the answer is it's knowing who the speaker is and to whom they are speaking, as well as when and where this narrative takes place. And what the situation is at the moment is also part of understanding context. So it's, it's, it's understanding both of these two elements in one. So unless you know, don't know those details, we can't claim to really know what a person's word means. Okay? That's why you never send an angry text ever. Or you don't ever send a text and try to put emotions into it. doesn't matter how many emojis you use. You always receive it differently. Okay. So hermeneutics is the key to this process taking place. I'm going to flip the next slide in. So we're looking at hermeneutics. Not Herman, because Herman's now gone. He's not the key. He's in Melbourne. If you're watching, we love you. But you're not the key. It's hermeneutics. Uh, and it is a theological term for interpreting Scripture. That's all it is. It's just a big fancy word, but it's about interpreting Scripture. Theologians do it all the time to try and determine what the Bible is saying and its implications of Scripture throughout all of history and mankind, Right? You and I actually do hermeneutics every time we read the Bible. So you're actually theologians. The question you've got to ask yourself is, am I a good theologian or am I a bad theologian? Because we all have a theology of who God is and what he's saying. Okay? So whenever we bring, and this is why we do it all the time, when we bring our own form of understanding to the text and apply what we, our own situation to it, we're interpreting scripture by our own understanding. It's hermeneutics. Is it good hermeneutics or bad hermeneutics is what we want to settle. How do we read this correctly? So, hermeneutics asks the question, what part of scripture do we leave for those in the first century? And what is applicable today for us? And it's very important we, we nut that out. Otherwise, we can get really confused and start building doctrines on things that we never needed to build doctrines on. Amen? Cool. So, Basic rule of thumb for good hermeneutics is this. Number one is recognize when God is addressing an issue for the original readers primarily. I'll give you an example of that. And number two is knowing what parts of Scripture being interpreted must be considered in the wholeness of Scripture. So an interpretation must be consistent with the rest of Scripture. If it's not in the rest of Scripture, maybe it's, there, it's for a reason. Yeah? Is this making sense? Have I lost anyone? Mum, do we get it? She gets it. You should all get it. This is awesome. We're doing well. <laughs> so let's give an example. 1 Corinthians eleven fourteen. Your Bible says this. Paul tells us, does not even nature itself teach that if a man has long hair, it is, it is a dishonor to him? <laughs> My mum is really excited right now. Get a hair. 
cut. <laughs> now I'm preaching up here with long hair. If you want to cut my hair, it's not happening. What's going on? What's going on? This is a Jewish context. I don't, I don't, you don't see this in any other um, throughout the scripture. It's not a theme you see. But what do I see when I do a little bit of digging is that in Jewish custom, Jewish custom, I'm Italian, but Jewish custom having long hair was considered feminine. And so it actually was something dishonorable for a man to have long hair. Does that apply to me today? I don't think so. <laughs> but I can catch the heart of what God is saying through that text for me today, right? Do you get what I'm trying to say? All right, cool. What about this? Romans 3.23. For everyone has sinned. All have fallen short. Do you see that thread everywhere else through the Bible, or is it just that one verse? Everywhere. Is God speaking to the people in the New Testament? Absolutely. But he's also speaking to you in 2023 today. Do you, do you see what we're doing? All of a sudden, reading the Bible becomes a little bit more, tr- not trickier, more of a like, okay, how do I do this correctly? So we build right, and then knowing what God wants to say to me today. Yeah. There's a book called Them, Us, and Me by Jacqueline Gray. If you haven't read it, recommend it. Australian author, really good. I read it when I was doing my Bachelor of Theology and it really helped me understand something. And um, it, it, the book is summed up like this. When we read the Old Testament especially, we should read it in three parts like this. What is the author saying to them? What is God saying to the original audience as they wrote that? Okay, first point of call, what is he saying to them? Second, through that, what is God now saying to us as a church? Okay, and then through that, what is the Holy Spirit revealing to me now through that verse? See, we like to be the center of every story. When you read it, God is speaking to me. No, 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 no. God is speaking to Paul first. He's speaking to Timothy first. He's speaking to Jeremiah first. He's speaking to Moses first. Okay, he's not speaking to Alana first. Okay, he's not telling, he's not telling Leo that there's a Red Sea. He told Moses there's a Red Sea. But what has he done? Through that verse, he's actually telling Leo there is a Red Sea miracle about to take place. There is no physical sea in front of you, but what you're going through is a miracle that's about to take place. See, he's not talking to Leo first, he's talking to Moses. And through that scripture, he's now talking to Leo. Okay? So how do we do this? How do we actually go through and do good hermeneutics? All right? <laughs> we're going to do something, and it's called, we're going to do good exegesis. Everybody say exegesis. It's not X-J-E-S-U-S. Okay? It's not X of Jesus. That's what I thought it meant. But it's not. It's exegesis. And uh, this involves the careful, systematic study of the Scripture to discover the original intended meaning of what is being written, what's being written. Now, that's important. Exegesis, it studies Scripture to discover the original intended meaning of the text. Okay? And we all do this in one way or another. Again, you guys are brilliant theologians. Well, hope, hope, we, we're good at doing theology, okay? You do this all the time. I'll show you how. We always say things like, or, what Jesus meant was, or back in those days, or, 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 or in Jerusalem it was like. What are we doing? We're actually trying to find the intended meaning of the verse originally. So it's like we want to do the int- what within its language, culture, audience, and situation, what is the text saying? And then how is it speaking to me today? Is that understood? Like, I want us to ground on how to read Scripture correctly, yeah? So, the key to good exegesis is that the key to good exegesis and therefore to a more intelligent reading of the Bible is to learn to read the text carefully and to ask the right questions. So, what I'm going to do this morning, welcome to Theology 101. And we're going to get certificates, Kieran, get them all ready, 200 certificates. I'm joking. I'm going to give you three tools. There's, prob- there's like seven or ten, there's heaps of tools, all right? I want to give you a little bit of a taste, then I want you to go away. If this is something you want to continue to study, go on and, and research some more things. I'm going to give you three tools to help you exegete Scripture, to have a better, good un- interpretation of it, so we become better with hermeneutics. That's very big words, and I finally get to use them, and it makes sense. Pretty much what I said is I'm going to give you handles and tools on how to read the Bible correctly according to what the original word was. So the first tool is make sure, first slide, it is contextualize the verse within its passage. Contextualize what verse you're reading 
in the passage it's found in. Have you ever walked into the middle of a conversation and you've just heard a part of that conversation? You're like, oh, mate, that's not cool. I'm just going to walk away and just out of here. Like, you know, um, we, I, oh, I do it all the time. Like, I'm just with people and I'm talking loud and all of a sudden the music stops or everyone stops talking and you've just said this one line completely out of context and everyone looks at you like, oh, what the heck did you just say? He's like, that's not what I meant. That's not what I meant. The context is... He's trying to... We do that every time we open up the Bible and we pick a part and we want to read. We're reading something in the middle of a conversation or an instruction or a narrative that is taking place. That's why I recommend if you're going to read the Old Testament, start from the beginning of the Old Testament and work, work your way through. Because you're going to get to Exodus and go, why are they in Egypt? Or you're going to get to Kings and go, what, what happened? What happened to Moses? So it's really good to start from beginning to end when it comes to the Old Testament. That's just my thoughts. Um, I think it's important. So Gordon Fee Great book, How to Read the Bible for All It's Worth. Fantastic. Honestly, it's a great, easy read, theological book for layman's people, so anyone can pick that up and read. He says, it's the first reason one needs to learn how to interpret is that whether one likes it or not, every reader is at the same time an interpreter. That is, most of us assume as we read that we also understand what we read. And so it's important for us to actually go a bit deeper. So... What is the primary purpose in considering reading Scripture in context? We want to make sure that we can derive correctly the meaning and the intent of the author. So what do we do? I'm going to give you this key in a second. When you're reading a verse, read it within the chapter. What does the beginning of that verse say? What does it say after that verse? What's going on? Read it in the chapter, then read it within the book. Okay, And then look out for these words. I'm going to give you a clue. Look out for linking words or bridging words or joining words. It's a word that is there in Scripture that links two verses together. So it's like, hey, Pavs, you did an incredible job at um, something. You did a great job being a cop. And because of this, I'm giving you a pay rise. You just read Pavs has got a pay rise. But why do you get a pay rise? Because of the great job he has done. We have to link the two. So when you see things like because, so that, however, therefore, um, for, when you read this, we're going to have to make sure what does it say previously so I get that verse correctly. Now let's put this into practice, all right? Let's do an exegetical study on Jeremiah 29, 11. And all the Pentecostals, ha! Yes, for I know the plans. And we start getting excited. We love that verse. And we're like, it's my verse. It's, it's, like my, it's like on my bumper sticker. It's on my car. It's on my T-shirt. It's everything. But the word says for. I know. Like it's a joining word. What does that mean? Okay. For I know. The very first verse before that, verse 20, verse chapter 29, verse 10 says this. When 70 years are completed... For Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. All of a sudden, this verse has become something a little bit different than what we originally mean. Let's have a look. Let's do a bit of a study on it. I just looked at that first verse behind it. Uh, but what's going on? I thought it was a prosperity verse. Or the, you know, this is God wants to bless me. Nothing's going to harm me. Everything's going to be good. I'm a millionaire by the time I'm 40. Not true. I'm not a millionaire, right? What's going on, right? What's 70 years about? So we discover from the previous chapter, I'm not going to go into it for time's sake. I want you to go and read it. We discover from the previous chapter that Jeremiah has announced judgment upon a false prophet, Hananiah. Han- Hananiah. So Hananiah the prophet, he told the people of, the, told Israel, hey, God's going to let you go in two years. You're going to be set free. You're going to return uh, home from Babylon. Babylon's taken over. While it sounded good, it was wrong. So God punishes Hananiah. Rather, Jeremiah tells the people that you're now going to be under captivity for 70 more years. Okay, that context all of a sudden is like, what the heck is going on? Let's go to the beginning chapter, sorry, the beginning chapter 1 in Jeremiah. This is what God says. The Lord said to me, to Jeremiah, from the north, disaster will be poured out on all who live in the land. That doesn't sound so good. Don't take that verse out of context and own that. That's not good. I'm about to summon all the people of the northern kingdoms, declares the Lord. The kings will come down, set up their thrones in the gates 
and in the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem. They will come against the wars, against the towns of Judah. I will pronounce my judgment on my people. Why? Because of their wickedness in forsaking me, in burning incense to other gods, and in worshiping uh, with the hands that they're made. So all of a sudden, you see a people who have walked away from God and started to worship other gods. And in the midst of worshiping other gods, God's trying to bring them back. And they're not listening. So it's like, fine, punishment's coming your way. Babylon, the enemy, I'm allowing them to take you over. They are going to rule and you're going to be in captivity for 70 years. But in the midst of that 70 years, I have a plan in what is going to happen. Sometimes we're in the midst of the wilderness. We're in the midst of a trial. We're like, I don't understand why I'm doing this. I thought your plan was for me to do this and then this. No, no, no. Kieran, that's your plan. But God's plan is much bigger than what your plan it is mine. All of a sudden, this is helping me to get understanding. Hang on. This is your plan. For Israel, and it is good and not for evil, and it's not to harm. It's actually God wants them to prosper. Why? And then he says this. What's the verse after? Does anyone know after 29, 11? What's 29, 12? I didn't know until I read either. (laughs) Then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me. And when you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and place where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. Twenty nine eleven is not a prosperity message. It's not a prosperity verse, although if you want to claim it, you can, but it's one of repentance back to the heart of God to make him number one again that's good hermeneutics because all of a sudden the character of God is not just one who just wants to bless but wants to call him back to yourself in the midst he still wants to bless even though they turned away isn't that crazy (sighs) can I hit one more point before we into the next one I feel like the Holy Spirit wanted me to say this. That was my teaching hat. I'm going to put my preaching hat on, okay? Romans 7, 19. I'm going to step on toes. I've stepped on some toes. I see some faces. It's good. Forgive me. It says this, For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, I keep doing. And all of a sudden, we have an excuse to keep sinning because Paul struggled with sin. I struggle. I believe that. Oh, I'm struggling with sin? Paul struggled with sin. Sin. He's my homeboy. We're good. I can, I can, God's grace is going to cover me sinning because Paul struggled and he wrote the Bible. It, we're going there. We're going there? Yeah. We're going there. Romans 7. Okay. What is the surrounding verses in that? It's talking about the law. It's talking about how, uh, let's go, let's go. Where are we? Verse. Oh, we have so much time. Anyway, uh, it's good. So it's talking about for... Um, For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am made out of flesh, sold into sin's power. I do not understand what I'm doing because I do not practice. He's talking about the law. It says here, I agree with the law that it is good. So now I know I am no longer the one doing it, but the sin living in me. What is he saying? The whole chapter is about being under the law. The first few chapters before that, Paul is talking about to live under the law. You guys want to live under the law? This is what it looks like. The law causes, the law's not evil. It's the sin inside us causes us to want to sin because the law says do not touch how many times do i tell my son joshua do not touch the tv bam aria do not touch the plants bam judah don't do this bam what happens it's like your sin inside wants to touch so when you're under the law with paul saying when i was under the law the things i wanted to do i couldn't do but the things i don't do i want to do why because it's like do not touch what i want to touch it tastes good it tastes good i fought the battle lost the battle that's what paul is saying and then he flips it in verse 8 he talks about but now in christ there is no condemnation and then he starts talking about under the power of the holy spirit when he controls your mortal body, you are dead to sin. He's not struggling, he's dead to it. When that became alive to me, I just went, whoa. The enemy's been trying to use scripture to hold me bound in sin. 
I'm set free. I am, I am dead to sin. I don't need to struggle. 1 John tells me that if I sin, the word if means in the original, if, if, not when, if I sin, there is an advocate for my sin. All of a sudden, Scripture comes alive and I see what God is trying to say. And all of a sudden, I don't have an excuse to be, you know, do you get what I'm trying to say here? Yeah? Okay, cool. If you are struggling with sin, I pray that this releases you and go, you can be set free from sin. When the Holy Spirit takes over your mortal body, you'll be set free from that sin. All right. Let's keep going. The second tool real quick. So the second tool is this. Examine the passage based on the original culture and language. Very important, okay? Real quick illustration. Back in the 60s, if I'll say to Kieran, hey, dude, you're sick, what am I saying? It's actually sick. If I'll say to Kieran today, hey, Kieran, you're sick, what am I saying? You're cool. That's a bit weird, right? I was listening to a worship song with my wife this morning. Praise. Let everything. I was like, wow, that's a wicked song. I'm like... Wait, wicked means evil. Why did I just make it sound like that's a cool thing, right? Like, like things change, right? When Back in the 60s, if you were to say, gang, gang, what would you think? There's the mafia. There's a gang after you. But now Kieran goes, hey, bro, gang, gang. I'm like, whoa, where's the mafia, man? He's like, oh, no, that means all good. I'm like, oh, my gosh, how language has changed. If I went to America, I'm like, hey, dude, I'm wearing thongs tonight. You're wearing a thong tonight? I'm like, no, I'm wearing thongs on my feet. Why would you wear thongs on your feet? It's like, what are you talking about? Flip-flops. So you can see... That we have a bit of a cultural barrier with language and even a history barrier with language. Well, guess what? Your book was written in Greek and Hebrew, and Aramaic, or Greek and Hebrew, and it was spoken in other languages 2,000 years ago in Middle East. So do you really think some of the words translate well? Not really. I'm going to show you an example right now. So uh, there's three methods that's going to help you. If you want to know how to do the, write these three th- things down. Okay, if you want to know how to get the original language, look for an interlinear Bible, okay? So this tool allows you to read alongside Hebrew, Greek, and English all in one. So that's really cool. It says Paul, and then the English word, the English word, and then the Greek word. It's awesome. And you can buy the Sakura and download the app. It's really good. If you want to go deeper in that, get a le- uh, lexicon Greek or Hebrew Bible. It actually gives you the meaning of that Greek word and in English, even better. If you don't know how to do any of that, Download a concordance. First thing Leo told me to do when I joined this church, go to concordance. What's a, what's a that? Incredible. I sound like my mom. You click on the word and it gives you the, the Greek meaning, the Hebrew meaning, and what it originally intended it to mean. I'll show you an example of how we get it wrong because our language is so different. All right. Jesus said this, Matthew 5.48. Therefore, you shall be perfect as God is perfect. Who's perfect in this room? Stand up. Will the real perfect person stand up? No one's here perfect. What do you do with that verse? Do you just let it go because I don't get it? Or do you actually want to get what Jesus is saying? Let's go have a look. Okay, so we'll ask a few questions. What does that word perfect mean? What's the context? Where else is it found in the Bible? All right, cool. The context of this is forgiving a brother. Is It's in the middle of the Sermon of the Mount. Okay, so he's talking, he's speaking to the people, and then he goes, I've said all this, so now be perfect as God is perfect. And then you look at the Greek word for perfect, it's teleos. It actually means complete wholeness, growth in mental and moral character in maturity. So be perfect, be complete, be whole, be mature like God as he is. Something you can actually obtain to becoming just like God, rather than be perfect, walk away. And then your kid goes, how can I be perfect? It's impossible without Christ. Amen. Where else do we see this verse? James 1.4. But let patience have its perfect work, that ye may be perfect and wanting nothing. Is that word again? Teleos. Some translations have changed that word perfect. And, it's, and, and, and let's have a look. And it means maturity. So let patience have its mature work in you. Let it be completed. Well, what kind of patience? When my daughter annoys me, when my wife doesn't listen to me? Not that kind of patience. Let's take that verse into contextualization of the passage. Brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Now, let this patient have its perfect wholeness, complete work when you're going through trials. Why? So that you may be complete and whole. 
soul lacking nothing in Christ Jesus. All of a sudden, you want to start to welcome these trials because you know God is doing something in you to make you mature to be like Christ. Do you see how all of a sudden, good hermeneutics, actually God is speaking something. I will look at that and go, I can't be perfect. Next. But we're not doing that. We want to go into it. Is this okay? Can I give you another example for me of that last point? All right, cool. Um, what about the original culture? That was the language about culture. Matthew 5.39. Do, but, but I say, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. I do karate. And I've been in so much trouble because I don't turn my cheek anymore. And I'm slapping the other cheek. No. Um, So people have used that verse against me doing martial arts. I'm like, cool, I love you. Read your Bible better. Um, But this is the one I want to talk about. And if anyone sues you, this NIV says this, if anyone sues you for your shirt, give him your jacket also. Who has more than two shirts in their house? Okay, who has more than two jackets in their home? All right, cool, we all do. It's a simple throwaway verse, right? What does the culture say about these two products? Let's have a quick have a look. It's a tunic and a coat. All right, so the tunic in first century uh, people would use it as an interior uh, to sleep in. It keeps you warm. It's an interior um, garment, right? The, the jacket is a garment of the outer, outer garment. It's this cloak that you wear. Now, by law, if you read in, in, in Exodus 22, 26, 27, take a notes, Deuteronomy 24, 12, 13, it says that Mosaic law said that the outer cloak was a possession that could never be withheld from someone, a debtor, and had to be returned before the night, overnight. So it's a cloak that you must keep with you. This cloak was only one. You can only have one because it was that expensive. You had one. And what Jesus is saying is this. If someone's about to sue you for your inner garment, give him the most expensive thing you own. But by law, you're not meant to give it away and you're meant to be returned. Give it to him. Why? Because that's how much working out in peace within brothers and, and is so much more important than the greatest possession you own. Wow. Wow, really? How important is this cloak? Blind Bartimaeus. Jesus of Nazareth, have mercy on me. Shut up, blind about it. Shut up. And Jesus all of a sudden calls him in. First thing he does, he strips off his cloak. Because the cloak also represented authority. He strips it off. He's saying, my old way of living is behind, but my greatest possession is nothing compared to following Christ. It brings a whole new depth of meaning when you start to understand the original culture and language of the actual word. Hey? Awesome, cool. My final tool is this. Understand the genre that's found within the text. Whether you know it or not, there's multiple genres in this book. It's just not narrative. You got poetry, you got law, you got imagery, you got prophecy, you got a, 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 a apocalyptic writing, you know, you've got eyewitness account, you have wisdom, you have songs of songs, you have psalms. All of a sudden, if I was to tell a joke, you don't go, well, that was 100% accurate. It was a joke. <laughs> I'm not telling you ac- accuracy. I'm telling you a joke. If, if I was to read you, was, did, how we read the Bible compared to its genre is important how we receive it. I can give you some, a couple of examples, then we'll close. Okay, so obviously there's, there's, there's a whole bunch of parables. Te- All right, let's go. Let's go. I want to look at a couple of things. Jesus in his parables. Like, what's that? Yes, understand the beautiful, cool. So we're going to do an exegesis on some of these verses, understanding the genre and use for the text. He used similes and metaphors. Would you agree? Yep. He used a lot of similes, a lot of metaphors. What, what's a simile? Okay, this is, this is a, a simile. I'm going to show you a simile. Uh, he says this, For the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like this. It's trying to explain to someone something that you don't. Like, it's like it's like it's like Ivan. You should have seen. I went to the Janolan Caves and my wife. Oh my goodness! Like words can't explain how incredible it is. So I'm going to have to compare it to something that you can grasp. When John went to heaven in Revelation, he goes, "It's as white as this." His eyes was as fire, and it was like, and oh my goodness, if you could only be there, the kingdom of heaven is like this. He brings more of a weightiness 
to rather than saying it's this. You know, and other examples like this, right? So, so the kingdom of heaven is like a woman who was begging for the judge. He could have just said, like, he's talking about prayer. Sorry, the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about prayer. He could have said, hey, be persistent in your prayer. Be persistent. Okay, cool. I'll take that on, Jesus. Too easy. But what does he use? He uses a simile and a metaphor, and he goes, it's like, it's like, it's like a persistent wooden widow. It's like a persistent, and she begs, and she begs, and she begs, and all of a sudden, the judge is like, fine, you can have it. And it's like, like the way you pray persistently to God, he's a good, good father. He's not kicking you out. He will give you more. Like, he will give it to you. It's like this. The audience is waking up going, whoa, okay, I get it. It sinks home. It's really good. Then he uses a metaphor. Metaphors is interesting. He, 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 it's another subject. What he, and it's funny because it was in my sermon and it's been talked about all morning. He, he takes two different subjects. He takes two different subjects and he entwines them together. Two, like this, ready? I am the bread of life. You want bread? I know it was mentioned before. I am the bread of life. I fed you before. I'm not going to feed you again. I'm going to feed you continually. I am the sustenance for your spiritual body, the way bread is sustenance for your natural body. He's taking something that, that now, is he bread? No. Well, because then he says, I am the light. Is he light? Like he's a person at this point. He's not light, but he is light. He's, he, he's using metaphors to bring this powerful statement um, where the audience would understand, and he does that a lot. And so it's, it's important just to start to figure out how is he doing it. It's something not to be taken literal. You know, say, people say it's in the Bible, it's literal, it's real. Well, then when Jesus says, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Hey, people build doctrines around it. It's a metaphor. He uses one more thing I want to talk about. Is, um, I love this word. What is it, Leon? It's your favorite word. Hyperboles. He uses hyperboles. I've never used that word until I met Leon. What's a hyperbole? My kids do it all the time. Dad, I'm starving to death. Really? Call 911, he's dying. It's hyperbole. It's like, I'm starving to death. It's like my wife. You never clean the dishes right. Really? Never? I'm pretty sure it's the dishwasher. Mum, I need your dishwasher. You know, never go to Leo and say, you never. I have never. I used to say that. Leo, you never. Don't say never. I'm like, oh, you're right, actually. Stop saying the words now. <laughs> Stop exaggerating, Sal. Okay, like, literally, Laurie will go, I'm literally going to kill you. I'm like, it's a hyperbole. <laughs> she probably will. Mark 1, 4, 5. John was, came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching and baptism of sins and sins. Then all of the land of Judea from Jerusalem came out to hear him. Oh, hang on. Did every single man, woman, and child come out from their homes to hear John? No, it's a hyperbole. It, it didn't happen that way. You know, many cults and wrong teachings have been built by things like God wants all to be saved, therefore everyone will be saved. That's not true. It's not consistent with all the scripture when it says work out your salvation, fear and trembling and, and you know, all the other parables you see about the lost son. And Anyway, so if your hand causes your foot to stumble, cut it off. Hyperbole. What is he doing? Is he exaggerating for the sake of being an exaggerator? No. Ben can come up. He's stressing the importance of what he's about to say. Don't miss this. Don't shrug off a word like, aha, I don't cut my hand on foot. I'm not, you know, it's all good. What is he saying in that verse? The hyperbole is this. Sin is that evil that I would rather you go into heaven missing parts of your body. Don't do it, but recognize how real hell is and how real sin is and be done with it. Wow. All of a sudden, a weightiness goes on his words. That's what I wanted to share this morning. Now, for some of us, you might disagree with what I said. That's cool. We don't want a minor on the major. We don't want a major on the minor. I don't know. Listen. It's an NCMI thing, whatever, I ain't quite NCMI. No offense. <laughs> oh, that's just got an eyebrow of tail. <laughs> However you interpret the scripture, the key is one thing, becoming more like Christ. 
It's never about knowing more. It's never about doing things in your own strength. It's about walking a holy life unto Christ and mimicking Him in every way possible. That's why we do this the best way we can. Not to sound good, not to sound smart, but to go, God, what are you saying? Not what do I want you to say? What are you saying so I can line my life with it and walk in it? So Father, right now, I just thank you for every single person who's listened to the sound of my voice. And I thank you, Holy Spirit, that you're convicting and you're challenging even mindsets. Father, I just pray that we will just walk in the truest humility. You know, God will never contradict His Word, but He will contradict your understanding of your Word if it doesn't line up to what He's saying. So, Father, come and ruffle our feathers. If we believe something to be wrong, challenge it. Let us walk in humility. Lord, thank You for Your Word. It is full of life, life life-giving, life-powering, all-powerful. I pray, Father, we as we get a better understanding of how to wield your sword, we will walk in everything and how you've intended us to walk, fully equipped by your Spirit, empowered by your Holy Spirit to be just like you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen.